Thanks, Salome, for the invite to this incredible conference. Uh, amazing lineup, great opportunity to connect with others in the digital behavioral health space. And, well, if you know Salome, you shouldn't be surprised that she basically pulled together what could easily be the best digital behavioral health conference I've ever attended in, like, you know, a few weeks. <laughs> I'm Omar Manishwala. I'm a psychiatrist and I'm the chief medical officer of Dario Health. We make behavior change in chronic disease the path of least resistance. In other words, our focus is on using digital and hybrid approaches to make the right thing to do the easy thing to do. So you're hearing a lot in this conference about COVID and post-COVID mental health, and that's, that's the coming crisis. I'm sure Patrick Kennedy and Tom Insel will cover both those areas masterfully. You think about uh, economic insecurity, fear, physical distancing that's led to unfortunate social uh, distancing, loneliness, all, all the factors that, that drive a worsening uh, of mental illness. Just as we had leveled off deaths of despair in the U.S., now uh, we're going to see increases. And in particular, my, my heart goes out um, to those folks for whom home uh, is just not safe. People with domestic violence, intimate partner violence, child abuse, substance use disorders in the home, trauma. Home is actually the least safe place uh, for many women in America. And so if that's you or, or if it's uh, someone you love, I want you to know you're not alone. Uh, we're with you and we hope you get the help you need. And so we need to address that even more uh, urgently now. Add to that the fact that we know that ACE scores uh, and early childhood trauma lead to mental illness, and we expect more of that kind of trauma in this environment. So we aren't uh, talking about a year or two of negative outcomes from this, but we may be dealing with decades of impact, contrary to what the many of the experts are saying. Uh, this is likely to be uh, quite persistent in terms of its effects. In fact, a, a recent study uh, from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation estimates that we'll lose an additional 75,000 people uh, to deaths of despair, suicide and SUD-related uh, deaths, substance use disorder-related deaths, and uh, due to economic despair, due to economic despair. So all of that's really terrible. And... While in the U.S. we were way too late on testing, uh, on tracing, and on taking this seriously. We were too late. Um, there's still time for us to take the looming mental health crisis uh, seriously. And yet, uh, this acceleration of uh, remote interactions um, uh, has also had some positive impacts. Uh, in many ways, it's, it's ripped the Band-Aid uh, off the problem, exposing mental illness uh, where it had previously lay uh, hidden and driving up help-seeking among those who are suffering. And, and that's, that's a good thing. And I, I would venture to say that most uh, attendees here uh, probably agree that uh, opening the barn doors on digital health and on telehealth is a, is a good thing. Uh, and we hope that now that the digital health bell uh, is ringing, it can't be unrung. We, we hope it won't be unrung. Wrong. And we're seeing some really good moves from the regulatory standpoint in terms of telehealth. Uh, we're, we're starting to open the door in terms of remote patient monitoring and, and digital health. Um, we're seeing some improvements in uh, sensible approaches to benefit design. Uh, for example, waiving member cost sharing uh, and other kinds of favorable improvements in benefit design. Everyone hopes that these are not temporary. Once we see the benefits, I'm confident they won't be temporary. And even in this environment of massive telehealth increases, and, and in fact, I saw a study that, that came out just last month that showed that the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts telehealth claims had increased 3,600%, 3,600%. And all that's you know, really good news. Uh, but even so, we do know that the majority of people with behavioral health issues are not seeking care. 
And so what's urgently needed, what's, what's needed right now is uh, scale, scale. But everyone knows what happens if you magnify a problem. Uh, that's, uh, you know, if you magnify a broken system, uh, you magnify the, the problems in that system. So we need to be thoughtful about scale. And that's what I want to cover with you uh, today. What we're getting right, um, what we're getting wrong, and what we need to do immediately uh, to effectively scale uh, behavioral health and help all those people who are, are suffering and for whom simply providing access is not going to be enough uh, to improve their, their behavioral health condition. So we really have uh, three uh, types of, of key problems uh, when it comes to scaling uh, mental health in the United States. First and foremost, we do not have enough providers. Uh, we don't have enough providers and, and we won't have enough providers. Even if we um, open the faucet all the way, all the telehealth in the world, uh, and turn on all the providers and even increase the rate of training uh, and certifying providers, we still can't cover the people who need help. We have, in the United States, we have about 30, 000, uh, you know, 30 psychologists per 100,000 people. We've got uh, about 15 psychiatrists per 100,000 people. 15 psychiatrists per 100,000 people. There's no way that's adequate. We have, we have 115 million Americans who are living in areas where there are provider shortages, which is defined as one professional for every 30,000 people. So yeah, so telehealth can address some of the lumpy distribution, but it'll never solve the fundamental workforce inadequacy. The question is whether many or even most cases can be managed in some other way. Uh, uh, PCPs, the primary care physicians, um, and collaborative care, which is an approach that empowers the primary care environment with expertise and support uh, from uh, specialists, and uh, coaching rather than therapy for many, and, and really democratizing access to self-managed resources. And, and collaborative care is great. You know, collaborative care is, is very effective, but you know, even in fully deployed, even in academic environments, the majority of people who are exposed to collaborative care still don't really seek care for behavioral health conditions. So it's a, it's a big step forward, but it can't solve the problem. We, we have to think bigger. Um, and, and you know, the answer might even involve over-the-counter antidepressants at some point and other agents. The reality is, is many of these are, are safer than, than Tylenol. I know that's a little blasphemous uh, to say that, but um, you know, I'm old enough to remember when Zantac uh, was going to go over the counter and the GI docs were terrified of, of losing their business. And, and what happened? The opposite happened. And so in general, people can be trusted. You give them the information, people can generally be trusted within limits. You know, there, there is obviously a, a major and critical regulatory role. Um, but uh, the limits right now on many of these drugs are dis essentially discriminatory against people with behavioral health conditions. Uh, people with other chronic diseases have an array of over-the-counter options um, that can help them. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not paid by any pharmaceutical company, so I can say, you know, whatever I want here. But the reality is, is that um, the limits have been very draconian um, and healthcare paternalistic, and, and maybe it's time to take a look at, at that too. I don't think that's going to solve the whole problem, but we really need to come at this from a variety of angles in terms of, as I say, scale requires democratizing access to resources. Um, digital health really has to play a role because telehealth alone can't solve it. Uh, and, and, you know, let's face it, telehealth is mostly people talking on the phone. You might think from reading press releases and looking at websites that it's a highly digitally supported kind of tool. Uh, with video and dashboards and all kinds of, you know, uh, AI-driven insights. But the reality is, is the majority of telehealth uh, delivered in America is basically a provider talking to a person on the phone. And, and that, you know, look, that's a good thing, um, but it's really underutilizing its potential. And it's another reason why that alone won't solve it. It's like the old trope that we only use whatever it is, X percent of our brain. Well, we're using far less than 1% of the potential power of, of digital health. So telehealth's a great thing. We need a lot more of it. But that alone can't solve it. 
Um, and people spend most of their day, it turns out people spend most of their day and all of their nights not going to telehealth visits. Uh, and so care uh, where you actually are, where you live, where you work, where you, where you live your life is about integrating uh, support and care into your life into your life experiences and that's digital health really so that's how we'll make the right thing to do um, uh, the easy thing to do how we'll make effective care as we as we say at Dario how we'll make effective care the path of least resistance so we need to further expand access to peer support coaching approaches digital therapeutics um, in order to solve this because providers alone can't solve it I mean that's that's uh, simple math um, and so the second challenge to scale is that we're failing to uh, truly integrate. Uh, integration is a term that is used so widely, so loosely, um, that it's come to be almost meaningless. It, it lacks precision. Everyone says they're doing it. Almost nobody is actually doing it. In fact, integration as a, as a concept has become so watered down that many people actually believe that the mere act of a psychiatrist talking to an internist on the phone uh, is integration. And, and of course, that's a good thing, but that doesn't really constitute integrated care. Care is, is fragmented for many reasons, um, but our system is really training people to expect fragmentation. And as we've scaled our, our systems of care, we have scaled the problems, including fragmentation. Uh, I can't help you with that, Mr. Jones. You need to see Dr. X over there. Uh, or you, you have two different benefits. You have two different formularies. You have two different sites of care, four different mobile applications that you need to log into. Um, and, and I'm being generous here with the numbers. I mean, the fragmentation is, is really very serious. Imagine if every time you clicked on Facebook Marketplace, it sent you to a static printed newspaper classified ad section on another site. That's the kind of thing we're doing with behavioral health integration. If you're, you know, not to pick on anybody, but if you're, if you're a Silicon Valley firm and you bought a behavioral health startup, that doesn't make you integrated. You know, that, it's a good thing that you're, you're bringing that in, but it's, it's uh, if you partnered with a behavioral health telehealth firm and stuck them in your app, that doesn't make you integrated. If you scale that, you may get more people using that solution, but you also get larger problems, which become more difficult to fix. So integration is really about a unified, and, and perhaps the most important thing, personalized care journey. Users shouldn't even be aware. People shouldn't even be aware of a difference between behavioral health and physical health. That experience should be so seamless that people aren't even aware of the difference. Any more than, say, the average person doesn't need to know the difference between a vascular surgeon and an interventional radiologist. So just as an example, the, the approach that we're taking at Dario is you know you check a blood sugar you check in on your mood you log your meals you log pro-social activities you have passive gathering of mood antecedents you receive a micro dose of a digital intervention on mood uh, all you know all behavior change is contextual um, and it's not simple um, and so all those things can can be done together uh, generally in less than a minute or two uh, with effective tools um, and immediately providing value to the people who are doing it. People do what they view as valuable to them. If you want to scale behavioral health, you have to deliver a service that people perceive in real time as valuable to them. Uh, nobody should ever have to raise their hand and say, I'd like behavioral health or, or push another button or do anything differently. It should be part of an integrated care journey that's personalized to them. Uh, and the reason for that is, the reason that's important is that mental health is health. We created the differences. I mean, our system created those differences and that fragmentation. And the, and, and the way I see the industry going, we're at risk of simply digitizing those differences. And, and that's uh, akin to paving a cow path rather than really innovating to integrate. Uh, and, and, and the third area and, and the third final challenge we, uh, third and, and final challenge really that we face uh, to scale is cultural, cultural, and there there's so many aspects to this. It's it's hard to know even uh, uh, where to begin. Racial disparities in access to care, racial disparities in the actual care received, uh, racial and socioeconomic variations in in trauma, in stigma, in shame, in discrimination. 
all these are, are long-standing problems. And with COVID having a disparate impact, because COVID is having a disparate impact on this, um, the problem is only going to get worse and the, and the gap is only going to get larger. We, we live in a society where celebrities can be praised for seeking mental health care, but, and, and that's a good thing, but neighbors are still shunned for receiving that care, where people still lose jobs and get incarcerated for, for having an illness, where all care, not just mental health care, but, but all care is worse if you have a mental health condition. Your outcomes for medical care are worse if you have a mental health condition, and the care you receive is worse. And where care for chronic conditions is episodic, um, short-lived, inadequate. But just as much of a cultural problem is how the healthcare system itself, and, and even, you know, I'm sorry to say, even how digital health innovators are applying uh, sometimes very paternalistic solutions to this. The, the quote-unquote, I know what you need to do. I've read the studies. I understand the science. Let me see how I can force you to do it. Um, and, and that idea, rather than seeking to understand the unique barriers and, and accelerants, what's attractive to people um, that are personalized to each user. Um, and those, those differences between people are uh, non-trivial. I mean, they're, they're very serious uh, differences in terms of how people, what the barriers are, uh, social and behavioral determinants of health and, and others, and what the accelerants are, what the things that people are, are actually willing to do that they don't have the opportunity to do, but they would do them if they had that opportunity and understanding that. And that, that's the unique power, I think, that, that AI brings to this, which is member segmentation, personalization, personalizing care journeys. Um, and, and that's why we have a thousand, well, I don't know if it's a thousand, it's probably more than a thousand cognitive behavioral health apps and, and almost nobody uses them. Uh, and, and I'm, you know, I'm exaggerating, but, but basically there's, there are so many digital solutions for behavioral health and so low access, you know, it worked in a lab. Uh, so let's see how many people we can force through it is not a path uh, to scale. And uh, to solve that kind of uh, systemic cultural arrogance, we're, we're gonna have to worship at the altar of this mantra. What matters to people is generally far more important than what's the matter with people. And at the end of that path, with AI-driven member segmentation, with personalization, with sensitivities to, to social and uh, behavioral determinants of health, with attention to to people's preferences, their barriers, and their accelerants to change. At the end of that path lies engagement. The primary barrier to engagement is cultural. So, most people who need help aren't getting help. Post-COVID, the crisis is going to get worse. The impact will be felt for much longer than a year or two, uh, it's, it, especially with trauma. Um, providers alone cannot solve this. Uh, and neither can telehealth, although it, telehealth is a critical ingredient here. To get there, to get to scale, we're going to need to expand access to digital therapeutics and remote solutions. We're going to have to expand services to include coaches and peers, uh, not just psychiatrists and psychologists. And, and finally, smash once and for all the distinctions between mental and medical illness and, and treatment. And, and perhaps most importantly, we're going to have to eliminate the, the paternalistic uh, and arrogant stance that we know what's best, uh, people should do what we tell them to do. We know what people need. So there, there is hope. There is hope and scale is entirely possible. Digital health actually makes all of this possible if we make the right choices right now. Thank you.